Welcome to the last webinar of 2012 and the third in the Financial Friday series. My name is Derek Watson and I'm very pleased to be introducing Neil Carroll. Neil is an independent financial advisor with Money for Dentists. Now what links Cole Porter, Chris Tarrant and Delboy Trotter from Only Fools and Horses? The answer is the phrase, who wants to be a millionaire? This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards so if anything's unclear you can watch this again or any of the others in the series and pause and replay at your leisure or forward the link to anyone else you think may benefit. So Neil, over to you. Thanks Derek. Yeah, today's webinar is um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And it's an introduction to cash flow modelling. Let's start with a question. How much money would you need to save each month if you wanted to reach a million pounds? This is in my best Chris Tarrant voice. Um, is it A, £500, B, £1,000, C, £2,000 or D, 3000 If you start with a case study, um, this is Mark. He's a 35-year-old associate. Uh, Mark loves his job, but he has no desire to do it any longer than he needs to, so he's keen to start working at 60. Mark owns his own house and has good NHS pensions, but he wants his own nest egg in addition to this. Um, and since he likes round numbers, he's looking for a million pounds. So how is he going to reach his target? Cash flow modelling is the answer. Um, so what is cash flow modelling? What does it involve? Essentially, it's a series of mathematical tools designed to show how the money decisions taken today affect your financial future. And looking at Mark as, a, as, a, as an example, um, and keeping it really simple, if he wants to save a million pounds, and he suppo it, suppose he chooses to do that by stuffing a certain amount of money under his mattress each month, how will it work? Well, Mark's 35. He needs his money by the time he's 60. So that's 25 years um, to save. Or for those of you who know your 12 times table, that's 300 months. Okay, 300 months, saving a million pounds. It's all the threes, 3,333 and 33 pence. Okay, it's simple. Um, unfortunately, like most things that have been oversimplified, it's not much practical use. The first thing that spoils the party is inflation. Um, you'll all know about inflation, you'll have heard of it, with, whether it's the retail price index or the consumer price index, whatever you call it, however you measure it, inflation is the force that continually works against us as savers. If you're saving for the long term, inflation should be your, your single biggest worry. Because inflation is a thing that means a first class stamp, which cost nine pence when Mark was born in 1977, now costs 60 pence. It's a 650% increase in 35 years. How will inflation affect Mark and his million pound target? Even if we assume an inflation rate of just 3%, which given the UK's national debt and a long-standing upward pressure on things like commodity prices, 3% may be optimistic. But to get the same bang for his buck, or in Mark's case the same bang for his million pounds, by the time he reaches 60, Instead of saving for a million, he actually needs to save for £2,093,778. So much for round figures. Um, this means he actually, instead of saving 3000 he needs to save almost £7,000 per month to reach his target. He's clearly going to have to make different saving arrangements or different sleeping arrangements. So how can we improve this picture? Fortunately, Mark isn't alone. He has the most famous physicist ever born, and what Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe on his side, it's compound interest. On the advice of his chiropractor and his financial advisor, Mark decides not to sleep uh, with lumpy currency under his bed and decides to invest his money instead. Uh, Mark's quite cautious with his money, so he doesn't want to do anything too risky, but by wisely saving and investing, uh, getting his portfolio optimised and minimising the tax he pays, um, we can still project a return of 5% a year. Now, he has his money working for him now. Um, all he needs to do is save 3,500 instead of almost 7. Okay. It's a lot better, but it's still more than really he ideally wanted to save. So, how can we improve this further? Okay. Um, what we can do is we can harness the power of inflation and make it work for Mark. As we've covered, inflation is the thing that makes money less and less valuable as time goes on. 
what that means in practical terms for a saver is uh, you can actually save more each month without it costing more in real terms. Okay. Um, if Mark increases his monthly savings in line with inflation, keeping them same in real term, to reach his target he actually only needs to save 2600 a month. But Mark's quite a hard worker, he's confident his earnings are going to rise more than inflation, allowing him to increase his savings at a faster rate than this. If he does increase his savings by 5% a year, um, all he needs to do is save just over £2,000 a month to reach his million pound target. So going back to the original question, and it's a silly question really because the answer very much depends on who you are and how old you are and your individual circumstances, but for Mark in this case, um, if I was his phone a friend I would um, tell him C. Now, to let you into a little secret, Mark isn't a real person, he was made up purely for this um, case study. But the fact that he is fictional does make it a lot easier to play about with the laws of physics and um, see how a little time travel would affect Mark's finances. Um, if we look uh, at what difference 10 years either way makes to his um, savings, you can see if we go back first 10 years into the past. Okay. Um, if we'd met Mark when he was 25 instead of 35, um, to reach his million pound goal, he would only need to save just a fraction over twelve hundred pounds per month. Okay. Um, if he went ten years in the future and he um, he was forty five, he would need to save over four thousand. So saving um, is certainly improved and it's certainly made easier with time. And not everybody's got a time machine, but uh, with these things, the sooner you start them, the better. Now that's. Um, that's it for our case study, that's it for Mark, but it's not quite all for the, the talk. Um, what um, I'd like to have a quick look at is um, some cash flow modelling in, in real life problems. Um, in real life most people's problems are somewhat more complicated than saving for a million and there's always many more things to consider. But the principles of cash flow modelling apply and the more complex your circumstances, the more essential it is. Um, to have sound mathematical uh, methodology to find the answers. Dentists, for the most part, have pretty sound finances, uh, due in part to the fact that dentists are, are generally uh, fairly well paid. So even if you aren't great with money or aren't great with budgeting, if you've got £10,000 coming into your bank each month, you can normally balance the books. Uh, this can lead um, to complacency among some dentists, uh, some dentists that money isn't a huge problem, a hu huge issue which is fine if you continue to work for the rest of your life and continue to have this income coming in. But if you ever do want to retire or cut back your hours, um, it's essential to have um, a strategy to continue in the lifestyle that you've uh, become accustomed to. Um, I'm sure most of you know this and many of you will have already done um, some planning, often substantial, in order to reach your future goals. Um, but what you won't always necessarily know unless you have utilised cash flow modelling is whether the steps you're taking now are the right ones and whether you're doing uh, what you need to do to be on track um, to hit your financial goals. Okay. Um, the kind of problems I tackle for dentists in the real world um, are, are as I say, somewhat more complicated. An that would be something like education um, planning. Um, whether you're looking at um, paying your prep school fees or, or university fees, whether you've got one child or half a dozen, the kind of fees involved in this can be hard uh, to find down the back of the sofa each term. So um, a bit of forward planning makes things a lot easier um, rather than trying to uh, fly by the seat of your pants and, and pay the bills as they come in. But the difficulty is um, how much do you save and uh, where do you save it? Um, returns on cash investments are generally quite low. Um, stock market returns are low higher. Um, do tend to be quite volatile and are, are going up and down far too much to um, rely on to pay the bills. Um, in this model, um, we use cash flow modeling to optimize the returns from the stock market with the liquidity for cash and ensure the money is there when it's needed. Um, as you can see from um, this diagram, we would essentially run two portfolios side by side. Um, so. Um, feeding the, um, the cash um, portfolio with the investment portfolio 
um, and making sure that um, the money is where it needed to be um, so the competing needs for growth and, and liquidity um, are catered for as and when they're needed. Another useful application for cash flow modelling is to help structure a property portfolio. Um, even if recent economic problems have undermined the concept of safe as houses, buy to let property is still a staple of many dentist financial planning. However, it's often done without too much of a scientific planning, um, picking properties up along the way as it were. Um, where cash flow modelling comes in is answering questions like the optimum mortgage term for an investment property um, and how to deleverage um, your property portfolio because it's nice to have a million pounds um, in property but nobody wants a million pounds in debt when they retire. Um, these questions and many more can be tackled um, with cash flow modelling. Um, so whatever really the circumstances you are, there's a plan that can be put in place for you to make sure that you can uh, know how to reach your million pounds or your own individual goals. That's it for the cash flow modelling. Um, if anybody does have any questions, um, you can reach us on inquiries at moneyfordentist.com or you can call us on 0845 345 5060. Uh, my name's Neil and um, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if that's okay. You said that 3% inflation was optimistic over the long term. So did you mean that it's likely to be more than that? Not necessarily that it's likely to be more than that. Over fairly recent history, um, inflation has been fairly tightly managed and um, the Bank of England still has a, a target rate of 2% uh, for inflation, albeit it's not really hit that target in the last um, five or so years. Um, there are um, talks within um, within the bank and within certain uh, certain uh, people at the uh, finance ministry that um, a target for inflation is the wrong way for the Bank of England to go, and they should be targeting growth um, instead, which is potentially code for we're not going to hit our inflation targets and while the country owes so much money let's change the targets his interest <laughs> yeah to devalue the, to devalue the money so we owe less in real terms so um, it wouldn't surprise me if inflation gets higher than it has been over the last um, 10 or so years so yes I mean we uh, in this country we have a historical uh, record of devaluing our way out of any crisis don't we um, Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, some would say, uh, you know, th that uh, it stood us in good stead and still does. But uh, another question I've got to... Uh, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, yes, it depends who you are. If you're, a, if you're a saver, it doesn't send you in good stead. If, you, if you've got lots of debt, it can do. Well, that leads me into my next question, you see, because with interest rates being so low, at the time of recording this, it's a historical low of a half a percent for, you know, it has been for as long as most people can remember now. Um, it's obviously difficult to maintain the value of any savings in real terms. So uh, bearing in mind, uh, there's only really three places to put anything, is the stock market, property or cash. Where do you put your million pounds while you're saving it up? Well, that's part of, of what the cash flow modelling can, can answer. Um, cash savings are, are great if you need the money in the short term. Um, it's the only place you really can have anything if you, if you know you're going to spend it in the next five years because um, property um, and stocks um, do go up and down and can have liquidity issues. Um, so it, it depends on, on your timescales. The longer um, you have to... Um, save the money, the more you should be keeping it away from cash and keeping it in things like stocks and shares. Stocks and shares are asset-backed investments. They can't be devalued by printing more money. You own a, a, a section of, of a company if you own stocks and you own a physical property if you own the property. So the government printing money doesn't have the same effect on you as it has on people who hold cash. That's great. So just to reiterate, the webinar is being recorded. It's going to be available online. All the, um, the financial lectures uh, before this and presumably after this will, will also be there. So uh, once again, thanks for your time and attention.